All right, Break Hard Podcast, back for another week. Pretty busy weekend of racing. We had the NASCAR Xfinity Series and Cup Series at Michigan, IndyCar in Nashville on the streets for the Music Music City Grand Prix, not the Nashville Grand Prix. You have to get it correct. So we're, having, we're doing this on a Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, uh, getting ready to get into the evening here. Voted today. If you're in Ohio, go ahead and vote. Obviously, by the time you see this, polls will likely be closed because I'm not uploading it until probably Tuesday evening. Doesn't matter. That's a whole bit of information you guys didn't need to know. Either way, good weekend of racing, like I said, all around. Uh, we have some news to get into as well. Doing this on a Tuesday kind of allows us to talk about some more news that built off of news from the weekend uh, regarding Noah Gragson, of course. And uh, yeah, we'll get to that after we talk about the NASCAR Cup Series race at Michigan, which was one of the better races that we've seen in a while. And I heard Jeff Gluck on his podcast. If you listen to the teardown uh, like me, I tend to hate listen more than I tend to enjoy listening to them talk about the sport. But he did talk about how Pocono and Michigan have felt more like events in a sense because we're only going there once a year now and it feels like, oh, we're not going to see this for another year, so maybe something different will happen. And I'll be honest, like, Pocono lost its damn mind, of course, and then you have the race at Michigan, which obviously ran for 75 laps on Sunday, got rain, and then they finished the, you know, last 125 laps of the race Monday afternoon, uh, after having to deal with a bit of a missed shower there as well. I spent the entire race for the first time listening to the NASCAR officials channel. And if you have just your regular MacBook or your PC or whatever, you can just go to the browser, nascar.com race center, and listen to the scanners for free on there versus having to pay for the app uh, on your phone. So I listen to the scanners, because or listen to the... Sp um, officials channel because I've never just listened to that top to bottom in a race before and it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, really good insight in sort of what's going on when the caution comes out, how the spotter situation works with their spotters in turns one and two and then three and four. Although Tyler Reddick's uh, near spin after his team gave him a loose wheel, I never heard they called in which is kind of surprising because NASCAR loves to throw a caution for the minorest things. Um, is minorest even a word? Most minor things? And they didn't call it for that, which was kind of surprising because I don't think their spotter was actually looking. But having them or listening to them talk about, especially when the miss was happening uh, on on Monday, when the pace car was going down the backstretch, three times they called off the start of the race, the restart of the race on Monday because they were concerned about the heavy mist that was coming. Uh, uh, they also, you know, had the Flagman turn around and look up at the spotters to see what the spotters are doing, thumbs up or thumbs down in terms of if they want to go or not. I will say this, whoever's driving the new pace car for that replaced Kip Childress, that guy needs to talk louder into the mic because he talks like this and you can't really hear him. And he says, Tower, we have debris down in one and two. You got to talk up, bud. Nobody can hear you. I was like trying to max out the volume on my computer here to try to listen to him. I just couldn't because he decided to talk like he was in a quiet place. It made no sense to me. Like, you're in a car by yourself. Just yell if you have to. Um, but overall, that was really interesting. So if you haven't done that before, or if you want to, I, I definitely recommend it. It gives you a little bit of a different insight. It's not going to make you be like, oh, I have so much more respect for for race control before. But, uh, yeah, it is, you know, kind of different to get a different perspective on. So getting into the race, we had Chris Buescher once again. He goes back to back. I shouldn't say once again because he's never gone back to back, but he did win once again. He won last weekend at Richmond. He wins this weekend at Michigan. He pulled the old Kevin Harvick who won at Michigan last year and then went on to win at Richmond because the races were swapped last year. First time that a Roush driver has won back to back since Matt Kenseth did it in 2009. First time Roush drivers had two wins in a season since Ricky Stenhouse did it in 2017, I believe off the top of my head. Uh, when he won both Talladega and Daytona, 1776, we are the champs, Ricky Stenhouse. So RFK's back. I, I, they're, I mean, they're, they're definitely back. Two wins in a season now. They went back to back. They won at a short track. They won at a, a inter intermediate, um, two mile oval. They've won on two different, two very different styles of racetrack. And Ford continues their win streak at Michigan, now nine in a row, which is absolutely insane. It seemed like Martin Truex Jr. was going to win uh, the Michigan race this year. 
because one, the race got moved to Monday. Monday Martin, he's phenomenal on Mondays. He has two wins this year already on Mondays. So it just seemed like he was going to win, and he had the best car. If you talk to anybody on Sunday after that race got red flagged and postponed, everybody's like, yeah, that 19 car is fast. At the end of stage two, there's a restart with 14 laps to go. Martin Shrex pitted. The 13 other cars stayed out in front of him uh, to try to steal stage one or get some stage points. Over the course of those 14 laps, Martin Truex passed 13 cars and then got Daniel Suarez coming to the line to win the stage. He passed 13 cars in 14 laps using lessons he learned from Dale Earnhardt, apparently, to just absolutely emasculate the entire field there. And then, obviously, Chris Buescher was able to get him in the pit stop sequence and then hold him off. And... Martin definitely had the fastest car at the end of the race. I think even Chris would tell you that. But you have two super respectful drivers. Chris Buescher is never a guy that's going to rough a guy up to get a position or win a race. Martin Trex Jr., also the same thing. They're cut from that Mark Martin mold, um, cut from the same cloth as Mark. So you knew you were going to get clean racing, and that's exactly what it was. The Martin had a chance. He got alongside him, got alongside the 17 after tracking him down. And the air got taken off the right side of that car, and he got a little loose, washes up the track, and ends up going back about almost three seconds, two and a half seconds. And Busher then has to, um, Busher then, you know, has to try to hold him off, and then Martin tracks him back down, just can't get around him there at the end, though. And I think the margin of victory at the end of the race was around, what, one and a half tenths? Yeah, 0. .152. So, Really close finish there. They were side by side for a number of laps before then, and it's like, man, that would have been great if it was the final laps, but you know, whatever. So Chris Buescher wins back to back. He now has two wins heading into the playoffs. He's obviously locked himself in. Teammate Brad Kozlowski is sitting real nice in the playoffs as well. He's currently plus 168 over the cut line. So yeah, safe to say that Brad is more than likely going to make the playoffs. He's not officially locked in as of yet. And then we'll get back to the points in a minute. But overall, really good race. I think we're going to rate this race. I give it an 85. There could be more that you could do, could be less. Uh, it was much better than your typical Michigan race. I think that surface is maybe finally starting to wear in a little bit. You still have some PJ1 up in the upper portion of the track, which still kind of fucks things up a little bit. But overall, I think it's not too not too bad, and I think eventually it will weather its way in. Do we need to go there twice a year? Absolutely not. But you did have a pretty entertaining race. The 45 car of Tyler Reddick probably should have been involved there, but in typical 2311 fashion, his crew let him down once again. On that final pit stop, the rear tire changer, or the gunman rather, he runs around, he hits the... They, Put the new tire on, he hits the wheel nut, they drop the car, and he stutters to go back, and the jackman stops and then goes around because the gunman hits the lug while all the way to the car is on the tires, and he thinks it's fine. Spoiler alert, it was not fine. So they pit the car, they send him back out, and when he's getting up to speed, the car gets super loose, snaps, he gets sideways, almost spins all the way around, brings it to pit road, and then absolutely goes on a profanity-laced tirade, which is 100% justifiable because they've probably cost him three or four wins this year, the pit crew has alone, and Monday was no different. So they come in, they take the tire off, they put it on, and actually, you know, put the tire on. Here's a word of the wise, if you ever have a loose wheel, don't try to tighten the lugs when it's on the ground. Jack it up, get the wheel off the ground, tighten it down, and then torque it down once you put all the weight back on the car. In this situation, the wheel nut wasn't even on um, all the way, so when you hit it again, it just probably cross-threaded because it took them a while to get that wheel nut off uh, when he brought it back into the pits, and that wheel's just shaking around. So, really bad decision-making on their part. And I saw somebody say, oh, it's not the crew's fault, this is a leadership problem. Leadership's not the one out there hitting wheel nuts. So, yeah, should they preach, like, fix it now? Like, it's better to fix it now than, you know, send it back out there and then end up three laps down like they did? Absolutely. But at the same time, you can't keep having these problems. I mean, 2311 over the last two years has to have five to eight races at least I can think of where they've had loose wheels because they haven't got the wheel nut tight. That's not good. 
actually bad uh, in a lot of people's books. And it's costing them race wins, it's costing them points, and it could probably come back to bite them in the in the playoffs. At least Tyler Reddick has that one win, but at the end of the day, like, it's not a great look. So on Sunday, before the rain came, Kyle Busch goes into turn one, and he's alongside Ryan Blaney. He washes up. The eight car of Kyle Busch washes up, and then he blames Ryan Blaney for it, saying it's too early to race somebody like that. And then he sees the, the replay, and he immediately is like, yeah, I think I washed up there. So, yeah, it was all on Kyle Busch. His car was done for the day. He got to go home and not have to sit through another night in Michigan with that rain delay. So, kind of maybe worked out for the best for him. Um, he did have a pretty fast car, though. He, I believe he started, yeah, P8. So, he probably could have uh, at least got a top 10 out of that. And then 30 laps and 36 laps into the race, you have Chase Elliott blow a right rear tire. He backs it into the wall. Not a great look for him. Goodyear says there wasn't a puncture. Something obviously went wrong there. So Chase's chances of pointing his way in are basically out the window now. He's 55 points below the cutoff line with three races to go. And yeah, it's possible that he could point his way in. Absolutely. It's not math not mathematically um, out of the question. Is it unlikely? Yes. Is he in a must-win scenario? Basically. And the good news for Chase Elliott fans is... You have two road courses in Daytona coming up. Obviously, the Indianapolis road course is a bit of a toss-up. He's had one good run there, one bad run there, or mediocre run, I should say. I think he had a 16th-place finish there last year. And then he goes to Watkins Glen, where he has an average finish of 5.5 and two wins and probably should have won there last year before Kyle Larson pushed him wide in turn one on that restart. And then you have Daytona. He's got two wins on drafting tracks, none at Daytona. He has a really bad average finish at Daytona. But anything can happen at Daytona. Mike McDowell has a Daytona 500. So there's that. Having said all that, Chase seems completely disinterested in making the playoffs or doing anything that has NASCAR attached to it. He, talking to NBC after his crash, he seems super annoyed, which I would be too if I crashed out of the race. But this mopey Chase Elliott, which has been kind of his MO his entire career, but now it just, like, it doesn't seem warranted because a lot of it's on him, which you can get yourself down for sure. But, yeah, I don't know. You kind of at some point have to grow out of that little emo kid phase. And everybody will point to Kyle Busch and say he did it. Kyle's situation is a little bit different in terms of how he wanted to be perceived. Kyle Busch knew, knows he's the, he's the heel. He knows he's the bad guy. Um, so a lot of that is a bit of an act. And, you know, it's different. Chase just seems, he kind of comes across as, like, spoiled in a sense. I know he hates it for his guys. And unfortunately, he doesn't have anything to send home for his guys. But yeah, his whole attitude. And then he goes on to NBC and talks to Parker. And Parker's like, you know, now that you're, are you in a must-win situation now? And Chase is like, I've been telling you guys this whole time, it's a must-win situation. And it's like, yeah, you're not wrong. Like, a must-win is the easiest way to get into the playoffs for sure. But at the same time, he was very close to being able to point his way in with a good finish at Michigan even after missing seven races, which is absolutely insane that he's even racing these guys for a transfer, or for a uh, playoff spot, and he's only he's participated in seven less races than them. And you get all these Chase Elliott fans that are like, oh, he's had such a bad season, his finishes are so bad. His finishes aren't that bad if he's still able to try to, to almost point his way in over guys that have started every single race this season. We've had 23 races so far uh, this year, and... Chase Elliott's missed seven of them. He's participated in 16 races. Everybody else has participated in 23, and he's still competing with them. So that's really not that bad. And then you have these Chase Elliott fans that are like, oh, we got to replace Alan Gustafson at the end of the year. That's the dumbest thing you could possibly do uh, right now. But yeah, everything about Chase's season just seems off. And he just seems like he kind of wants to chalk it up as a dud, not make the playoffs and move on. And then you have these people that are like, well, if Chase doesn't make the playoffs, then the ratings are going to be down because there's... There's still a sect of this sport, door bumper clear included, that are like, oh, when Chase Elliott was out, we lost viewership, and then when he came back, we gained 500,000 viewers. That's absolutely not true. Um, Chase Elliott had very little effect on the play or on the uh, ratings when he was out. When he came back, it wasn't because Chase Elliott came back. It's just because the race was probably on network, if I can remember correctly. It's not... It's not the craziest thing in the world. Um, 
So if he misses, it's not going to be that big of a deal. And in years past, in Brian France's NASCAR, NASCAR would have gone and, you know, adjusted the playoffs to make sure that their most popular drivers made it in. The Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jeff Gordon uh, changes. Jim France's NASCAR is not going to do that. At least I don't think so. I don't think we're going to get 17 drivers in the playoffs um, next year. Or like the auto... <laughs> The most popular driver just automatically qualifies to be in the postseason. That would be very NASCAR. It's very on-brand for them. Like, maybe the Big Three Basketball League does something like that, but I don't think NASCAR is uh, going to. That was a shot at the Big Three for absolutely no reason. It still exists, in case anybody forgot about it after that first season. Everyone's like, oh, this is so cool. I think it's on, like, season six now, and everybody's like, this still exists out here. But, hey, more power to them if people are showing up to it. So, Chase Elliott not having the best season <laughs> gonna have to win to get in going forward and then you have the incident with josh barry he wrecks brings out the caution poor legacy motor club and every nascar account that had to tweet out that the 42 reg then had to endure the <laughs> stereotypical twitter avatar guy with the sunglasses and the hat taking a selfie saying good good free noah stuff like that because they're just brain dead um Unfortunate for Josh, unfortunate for the whole 42 team. And then you have the 20 car of Chris Bell. He wrecks, spins out, entering turn one, trying to pass Alex Bowman for the lead. And then he arcs it into turn one, and like Alex Bowman's not on the outside of him. Very weird. Spins out, backs it into the wall. And then the team spends all night, basically, because the caution for rain came out um, nine laps later, but five green flag laps later. Team spends the whole night trying to figure out how to get this car fixed going forward. And they did a really good job because he rebounded and finished P13 with a car that had no business finishing uh, in the top 15 in this race. Obviously, rain comes out after that. And then Alex Bowman just has the Chase Elliott luck this year. He ends up getting involved in the uh, front row motorsport violence on violence that they had. And he gets he's just a lone bystander. And that spun out. Bad day for him. And then we had a 67-lap green flag run to end the race, which was actually pretty refreshing if we're being honest. So, Chris Buescher ends up winning the race. Martin Truex Jr. finishes second. Denny Hamlin third. Brad Keselowski fourth. RFK with two cars in the top four. Really stout run for them. Kyle Larson in fifth. Daniel Suarez sixth. Ross Chastain seventh. Kevin Harvick eighth. Ryan Blaney ninth. And Eric Jones tenth. Even though people kept telling me all day or all weekend that Legacy Motor Club cars are trash. They're not good enough to get top tens. That's why Noah never got top tens. Even the teammate couldn't get top tens. And Eric Jones gets top ten. So... There's that. But the Cup Series moves on to the Indianapolis Road Course this upcoming weekend. Really stout driver lineup. You have Kamui Kobayashi making his first career start uh, in the Cup Series, first career NASCAR start ever in the 67 car with 2311 uh, racing. You have Shane Van Gisbergen back in the 91 for track house. You have Brody Kostecki in the 33 for... Uh, Richard Childers Racing, you have Jensen Button in the 15 car for Rick Ware Racing, making his last NASCAR start of the season, and now you have Mike Rockenfeller in the 42 car for Legacy Motor Club. Pretty stacked field in terms of, like, great international driver talent that's coming over to run this race. So, yeah, if you're in the neighborhood, if you're around Indianapolis, show up on Sunday. $35 uh, GA tickets. There's plenty of mounds all around the track for you to sit. You can wander freely. You'll never get better access at a racetrack for $35 than what you get at Indianapolis. And if you're around on Saturday, the Xfinity IndyCar doubleheader for $35 is the best deal in motorsports, probably. You get the Xfinity practice and qualifying session in the morning, followed by the cup practice and qualifying session, um, followed by the IndyCar race, followed by the NASCAR Xfinity race. So you get to see three series, all for the price of $35, and two complete races as well. Pretty good deal if we're being honest so if you're around check that out so on saturday we had the cabo wabo 250 sammy hagar apparently sponsored this race if he still owns it who knows but john hunter Nemechek picked up his fifth win of the xfinity season after spinning out early in the race uh, when you had all three jgr cars run into each other because ty gibbs got loose uh whether that was from the 50 or from the 20 car packing air onto his uh, rear bumper doesn't matter he never made contact with him until he did make contact but ty has to try to catch the car can't do it the 20 car of new check runs over him because he's getting run over behind by his other teammate in the 18 sammy smith and then after the race john hunter apologizes for 
tie getting loose and not being able to control the car in what has to be like one of the most pathetic Nepo apologies that you've ever seen from another Nepo baby, if we're being completely honest. So yeah, that was bizarre, but John Hunter definitely was playing the politics game with that because he wants a cup ride for next year and one just opened up at Legacy Motor Club now that Martin Truex Jr. has signed up for uh, another year in the cup series. So you have that 42 car open. He wants to stay in good graces with TRD and that's where we end up at. So you have um, John Hunter winning his fifth race of the season. Josh Berry comes in second, had a really fast car there. The probably the best car at the end of the race was Justin Allgaier. He ends up not uh, being able to contend for the win because he gets turned by Ty Gibbs on pit road, to which Jeff Burton said Ty Gibbs did nothing wrong, even though every other car was able to pit this entire race um, without running over the car in front of them. But Ty Gibbs runs over the car in front of him. Not his fault. The seven car should have gone faster on pit road is really what it comes down to. Very bizarre. Jeff Burton is just continually the worst part of the NBC booth week in and week out. But the JRM cars finally showed up and showed some speed because, like I said, Allgaier got ran over by Ty Gibbs there. He also, you know, drove back through the field. I think got all the way up to six maybe after, you know, having that bad pit stop from getting turned. And comes down pit road, pits, gets back out. And find himself in a pretty good spot, but his pit crew jumped over the wall too early, so he has to serve a drive through penalty. Meyer and Amole back in traffic, ends up finishing 14th instead of contending for the win with John Hunter. Josh Berry finishes second, Brandon Jones third, so JRM, our JRM cars finally had some speed. Ty Gibbs fourth, Sam Mayer fifth. Ty Gibbs looked unbeatable last year in the Xfinity Series. He comes back now this season, and he looks rather pedestrian, if we're being honest. Like He doesn't look amazing like he did last year. And it's almost like TRD put a ton of money, a ton of money, into that program last year, and then they're just not doing that this year. Weird. But you also have Riley Herbst finishing sixth, Ross Chastain seventh, Parker Klugerman eighth, uh, Parker Retzlaff ninth. I have to think that he's going to get a bigger look, or a look at a bigger team sometime soon. And <clears throat> Jeb Burton finishes tenth. So Jordan Anderson got both of their cars into the top ten which is pretty awesome for them. And then RCR has their cars finishing 11th and 12th. Overall, though, oh, I have to point out that Connor Mozak, once again, wrecked another race car. I'm pretty sure he's wrecked race cars in eight Xfinity races or been involved in at least that many. I think he only has 13 starts this year, too, or something like that. So not an ideal day for him or Sam Hunt or TRD. Why do you keep funding his race car? Because he also got damage in the... Um, Arca race on Friday night as well when he just sailed off into turn one had no idea how to make the corner hits Gus Dean and then shits the bet on the restart where he was in a pretty good position to win the race so Connor Mozak just doing Connor Mozak things is really what it comes down to Mason Maggio absolutely annihilated the wall in turn two like he was just trying to leave to go to East Lansing because he clobbered that thing uh, luckily he was all right, and then Sammy Smith was involved in that JGR uh, threesome. We're gonna call it the threesome crash. You just sometimes things just don't work out. You got to make sure everybody's comfortable with it, and clearly they weren't, and things crashed and burned. So that's where the Xfinity series uh, is at right now. Currently, the playoff structure looks pretty. Decent. Sheldon Creed's plus 18 over the cutoff line over Parker Kligerman. Um, Brandon Jones is 45 points out. He's in a must win. Parker can still maybe point his way in, um, but it's going to be a little tough because he basically runs the same place that Sheldon Creed runs at all year. Parker does have four top fives this year, though, so that's a really good um, stat for him. That puts him kind of like fifth or sixth is sixth ish on the list but the Xfinity series continues to deliver probably some of the best racing not some of the best racing in nascar uh, right now they are of course also off to the indianapolis road course on saturday for their double header with the indycar series uh, xfinity goes green at i believe 5 30 which is just ah oh, that's so brutally late compared to last year Last year's race started around 3 o'clock and probably finished around the time 
this one's gonna uh, probably get underway, which really sucks. So if you're going this year, just know that your day is getting a little bit longer. And I'm not 100% sure why, other than I guess Xfinity qualifying got pushed to Saturday now instead of being on Friday. Is I think I'm correct. But man, that that's a long day. It's going to be a long day at the racetrack. So if you're going, be prepared. I will also be there. And if you are there, let me know. Try to find me at some point. I don't have any around right now, but I do have brake hard koozies. And I will take a few with me to the racetrack in case people run into me. I'm also very tall and will likely be wearing a brake hard shirt. A white one though, because it's going to be hotter than balls out. Actually, it's only going to be 86, but still, we want to come prepared. So then also on Sunday at noon, a little afternoon East Coast time, IndyCar had the Music City Grand Prix. And if you're ever, if you've ever been to Nashville, you know that starting a race around like 1130 local time is not the best time to have a major event in a city where people are notoriously out very late, basically until the sun comes up. And then you wanna start a race five hours after they've gone to bed. Very confusing scheduling here. And obviously this is dictated by NBC because IndyCar of course wants to be on network NBC because that's where you get the most viewers. But uh, yeah, a very bizarre timing because generally this race is in the evening, not, not the evening, but the later afternoon-ish hours. Uh, because the sun's setting by the time, uh, you know, they get to victory lane. And this year, it just fell off. Everything felt off about it. The track was too bright. The sun was too high in the sky still because, again, it was before noon. And there weren't that many cautions, which I'm not complaining about that. It just didn't feel like the Nashville Grand Prix. We got a little taste of it at the end of the race. NBC missed coming back from commercial at one point on a restart, which that looked really bad. But this was the last race on this current layout. They'll switch to a different layout next year to make way for the new Titan Stadium that's being um, built, which will just ensure that more events go to Nashville in the future. So if you're sick of Nashville, well, just get prepared because you're going to get really sick of it because they're going to get Super Bowls. They're going to get college football playoff. They're going to get a Final Four. They're going to get a whole bunch of other things that go along with having a state-of-the-art, multi-billion dollar stadium which they are getting. So yeah, embrace Nashville, I guess. Maybe, hopefully it takes away having big time games and Super Bowls in New Orleans because the Superdome might be one of the worst places to have a big time event. They desperately need a new stadium there. Complete sidetrack. But, so the race starts at a weird time. The grandstands, there were some grandstands that had a decent amount of people on them. Other ones, I think, what, at the in the breaking zone, I think for turn one, I could be, I can't remember off the top of my head, corner wise, but that grandstand was sparse all day right there. It just didn't feel like the, the Nashville Grand Prix of years past, Music City Grand Prix, who cares? And so they're going to change the layout next year, obviously to make way for the Titans and it's going to incorporate lower Broadway. So the lower three blocks of Broadway, which will look really cool. Visually, it's going to look great on TV. It's only a seven corner road course though. Very simplistic. It, it in a sense reminds me a little bit of the Las Vegas Grand Prix with just long, just, just straightaways and some 90s, just to, I don't know, make it simple or something. The natural layout though looks a bit like uh, a music note or the Big Dipper because they're still incorporating the bridge. So they're gonna go across the bridge, basically into a 180 degree corner and then back across the bridge and the pits will also be across the bridge in that, that's not necessarily a hairpin, but it's a 180 degree corner. So you're gonna enter the pits on corner entry. And then there's four turns on pit road, seven turns on the entire track, four turns on pit road alone. They're gonna drive around a grass island because it's in a parking lot. So just think of your, your neighborhood strip mall with those grass islands. That's what any car is gonna have to drive around, pit the cars and then go back out and they're gonna enter the track in the same corner where they exit the track from, so they're gonna exit the track on corner, <laughs> on the entry to the corner, and they're gonna rejoin the track on corner exit, which is, I'm sure, just going to look very strange on TV. The start finish line, of course, is in the city right before you get to Broadway, and that makes sense. But at the same time, if the crew's all the way over here and checker flag's happening over here, 
where is Victory Lane going to be? Where's the podium going to be? And I know in typical IndyCar fashion, they're going to have it in that parking lot where the crews are for Pit Road, way away from all the fans, because why would the fans want to be a part of the celebration? And why would you want to promote your winner to the people that were there to see the race? What they should do, and I'm giving IndyCar this idea, and I hope they make it happen, is build a podium, Formula One-esque style. Think of Monza, think of Monaco, other tracks that have a elaborate podium. Build that podium right up um, where the track turns onto Broadway, lower Broadway right there. Why don't you build a podium right there where the corner is. It'll technically be outside the track to the left of the corner. Build it here. Build it raised up over the fence. I don't really care. And then you'll be able to have your driver stand up on the podium overlooking Broadway, where there's going to be a ton of people at. This is the season finale. This is going to be a well-attended event. So you can have people standing down there on the street, your drivers over them, pop champagne, spray all the people, do all the things. It would look visually really cool, and it's an easy way for you to promote your winner and your champion, because again, this is a championship race, to all of these people that are right there. You can get great visual shots, great photos, all of it. Make that happen. Do not have your race winner and your champion standing in a parking lot next to a fucking NFL stadium that's under construction. That's going to look stupid. IndyCar will absolutely do that. I know they will. I know IndyCar. They don't do anything that's innovative. They don't do anything that's going to be smart. But man, just one time, do that. Put your podium where the people are. Don't do it in the parking lot where the crews are. Get Just put the crews on a truck, put them on a bus. I don't really care. Bus them over to where the victory lane is happening at and have them celebrate there. I, it's it's so frustrating because I know they're not going to do the right thing, but and it's going to be a missed opportunity. However, it would look very cool. So Kyle Kirkwood ends up winning the race, his second race win of the year. Probably won the two biggest street races on the IndyCar schedule. Uh, he won the Long Beach Grand Prix. He's now won the Music City Grand Prix as well in the same season. Uh, he's the only driver to win for Andretti Autosport this year. Colton Hurtis still does not have a win. Just absolutely abysmal day for him as well. He finishes um, a ripe 21st place DNF um, with four laps to go. Thanks to mechanical issues in his new adopted hometown. One thing to note from Andretti this weekend as well. Roman Grosjean did not wreck. Very surprising. I think we all expected him to wreck once again. Didn't happen. So congrats to him. Still don't know if he'll be back next year. Kirkwood wins. Scott McLaughlin finishes second. He probably had the best car all day. Couldn't get around Kirkwood. Kirkwood got him during the uh, st or basically off of strategy. So bummer for him. Alex Plow finishes third. Joseph Newgarden finishes fourth. And his pursuit to catch Alex Plow in the points obviously takes a small step back as Plow beat him uh, last week. And Dixon finishes fifth. Grosjean 6th, Marcus Erickson 7th, Pato Award 8th, Christian Lungard 9th, and Will Power finishes 10th. Linus Lundquist filling in for the still apparently concussed Simon Pagano. He comes home a disappointing 25th. However, he did qualify 11th. He had really good pace all day. Showed what the true pace of those uh, My uh, Meyer Shank cars could be. His teammate Elio Castaneros picks up a P11, which is good for him. Meyer Schenck does have an announcement um, press conference scheduled for Friday morning at Indianapolis regarding their future driver lineup. What that entails, not 100% sure, but we it's safe to assume that Elio Castroneves will not be in that seat full-time next year, and there's a strong chance that Simon Pagina won't be as well. Tom Blomquist, their driver in the IMSA series, is rumored to be moving over to the IndyCar series. He, of course, got a start a couple weeks ago. Um as well on the streets of Toronto. Linus Lundqvist could be in play here. He's looked rather impressive. He'll also be subbing again for Simon this weekend at the Indianapolis Road Course on Saturday. So we'll see what's going to happen there. But yeah, so they have an announcement coming up. Speaking of other IndyCar Silly Season things, Marshall Pruitt says that David Malukas is linked to Ed Carpenter Racing. Nathan Brown from the Indy Star says that David Malukas is linked to Andretti Autosport. So I have no idea where David Malukas is going. He is a pretty decent young driver, but they're treating him like he might be the hottest thing on the market right now. And 
and I'll see that. Marcus Erickson apparently has received an offer from Chip Ganassi Racing to stay at Chip Ganassi Racing as a paid driver, not a driver that has to pay to be in that seat. He'll instead receive a salary. We'll see if that happens. Alex Plo is still rumored to be going to Aero McLaren. However, he might be in discussions with the Williams for the Williams F1 seat that Logan Sargent has, which, you know, Logan's looked a little bit better uh, in the second-ish half of the Formula 1 season so far. But I don't know if his long-term future is there. So we'll see what happens with Polo. And then poor Felix Rosenquist just kind of sitting out there like, I'll just go wherever people aren't going, it kind of sounds like. So we'll see what happens there. Roman Grosjean still not signed to... Andretti, after he had his back-to-back runner-up finishes in a top five, apparently his team sent over a contract to Andretti for an extension, and Andretti was like, no, we're not coming to terms on this, which was smart for them to do at the time because he hasn't done anything since then. So he's not signed up yet, and we'll see what happens to him. Maybe could be headed to Ganassi. We'll see uh, what happens there. And then Nathan Brown also says that DHL is looking to move on from Andretti Autosport potentially to Ganassi as well. So a lot of silly season things moving around. We'll see what happens. It all should start to play out, though, over the next month and into uh, early September. We'll get things locked in uh, for some drivers, at least Devlin DeFrancesco potentially going to add Carpenter or Coin. Uh, we'll see what happens. But overall, any race at Nashville, pretty good. More excited to see it as the season finale next year. And, god damn it. Sorry, guys, got a text. Um, and see what happens there. So, more to come on IndyCar's silly season. Time for the news. Uh, we'll just keep the news short. Martin Truex Jr. signs an extension to race in 2024 with Joe Gibbs Racing. Part of that deal also includes his brother, Ryan Truex Jr., getting a partial schedule, potentially a full-time schedule. And this is me just thinking out loud. It would be pretty cool if Martin did, in fact, like take less money so his brother got you know another partial schedule in that Xfinity car for JGR, even though he fully deserves to be in it because he straight up just beat everybody's ass at Dover and won that race. Or if he was like, I'll come back under the basis that, you know, Ryan gets this if he tried to strong arm Gibbs and TRD. Either way, pretty cool that uh, both of the true X's will be back in some capacity next year as well. Noah Gragson, of course, got suspended indefinitely by his team Legacy Motor Club and NASCAR on Saturday after it came out that he liked a racially insensitive meme on Instagram regarding George Floyd. I've seen a lot of people be like, oh, how does he get suspended for liking a meme, what happened to freedom of speech, NASCAR's woke, woke's getting thrown around. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's the word that's getting thrown around at, at all times. Now, I'm just so tired of hearing how everything's woke. People that are saying woke don't even know what it means anymore. So we're just going to ignore that point. We're going to talk about the freedom of speech point. No, it does have freedom of speech. He has the freedom to say what he did. He has the freedom to do what he did. There are consequences for that when you represent brands, sponsors, teams, everything like that. If this was Noah Gragson racing and Noah Gragson was sponsoring the car and Noah Gragson was writing all the checks, Noah Gragson can do whatever the hell he wants. He's not in that position, though. So he has to answer to people. They don't like what he did. So he got the boot. Um, and then on Tuesday morning, it was reported by The Athletic that Legacy Motor Club uh, will part ways with Noah Gragson. The team came out and said that isn't true. I think that's because Legacy got this from a source and probably the Athletic has got this from a source and Legacy probably didn't want them running with that information yet because they still have to work through the legalities of getting rid of Noah Gragson and what that looks like. So of course they're going to say that Noah's still with the team because they're still working through the legal aspects of this. Noah Gragson's never getting back in that 42 car. They'll just have somebody else in there for the rest of the year. Obviously, Mike Rockefeller has been announced to race the next two races for them at the Indianapolis Road Course and Watkins Glen. And who's in the car in Daytona and beyond is still TBD. But that's kind of where we're at at the moment with the Noah Gragson thing. He did apologize, but, you know, it, it's, it's over for him at Legacy Motor Club. They were ready to move on from him anyway at the end of the year and put John Hunter in that car next season. So... 
some interesting news that come out there. We also had a little Formula One news that the Las Vegas Grand Prix has potentially gone over budget by $400 million, which is astronomical. I don't know if you're making your money back um, from that, but good for them. They're also selling uh, GA tickets for the U.S. Grand Prix at Coda at Costco, so for $350, which is cheaper than what you can get them from the Coda website, you can do that. So if you have a Costco membership, it also apparently is geo-gated, geo-fenced um, to regions maybe outside of Texas. I haven't tried yet. Maybe I'll get on after this and try, but very bizarre that they wouldn't just let you buy them if you wanted to go. And then we have, um, obviously we already talked IndyCar silly season. F1 silly season really not ramping up and I don't think much is going to happen other than maybe Williams seat being open or um, Alfa Romeo moving from Sauber over to Haas, stuff like that. But no major driver switch is happening this season. At least it doesn't seem like it unless, you know, Red Bull wants to get uh, wild and just throw an absolute bomb, chaos bomb into everything. But overall, good weekend of racing, good weekend of racing coming up. You have the ARCA series on Friday night at 6 p.m., on FS1, Frankie Muniz just got his first top five finish on this past Friday night at Michigan. Can he do it again at IRP? Tune in to find out. You also have Shane Van Gisbergen making his first NASCAR Oval start on Friday at IRP as well. That race will also be on FS1, I believe, at 9 p.m. And then on Saturday, you have the IndyCar race at 2 p.m. on USA. The Xfinity race at 5.30 p.m. also on USA. And then on Sunday, you have the NASCAR Cup Series, I believe at 2.30 from the Indianapolis Road Course with a star-studded field. And you also have the Knoxville Nationals on Saturday night. See if Kyle Larson can win there. Can Donnie Schatz once again show up in a big race and get it done? Or does Brad Sweet, David Gravel pick up, uh, I believe, their second uh, Knoxville National? I have to wait and find out. But... Either way, good weekend of racing coming up. And or of course, F1 is off until the last weekend of this month where they return at Zandvoort. So like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram, Twitter, and threads at BreakHardBlog.